Se, ah. aí já, agora está você lá, você está em vivo. Ah, tá bom. Tá certo. E aí Sim. todo mundo que entrar, entra diretamente. É, você vê que já tem seis pessoas que entraram, sete. Você está vendo aí à direita? Ah, tá. Atendi isso. Ah, okay. entendi. Se você clica em atendiz, é. você vê... As pessoas. É, você... Sim, e todo mundo pode ver quem está aí. Ah, tá ótimo. Excelente. Entendi. Ok? Agora, por exemplo, uh. o professor Plomsky, que você queria é, uh -huh. aplicar para fazer uma pergunta, uh -huh. é só clicar no nome dele e uh -huh. clicar à direita. Allow to talk, certo? Sim. Tá. Professor Plonsky. Muito bom dia. Muito bom dia. Prazer tê-lo conosco aqui. Tamo... Recíproco. Estamos <risos> aqui... No processo de aprendizagem intensiva. Intensiva. Como é que funciona o, 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 o Zoom. O Zoom, é. Na verdade, é a minha primeira experiência. Nós estamos aqui online com a, com a Marga, com o Pedro, a Gabriela, o time aqui. E as pessoas estão entrando aqui, vamos dar um tempinho, né, para a entrar. Esse teu fone de ouvido vai sair na, na, na caras, né? Tão, tão chique aí. <risos> é, e eu, tá muito eu, profissional, eu, hein? Não eu, é? E o fone da Marga? O fone é de, da, da Marga, Marga é, de, é de Popstar. Da Marga, da Marga é, não vi, mas... Is, is, is a Popstar Micro. Mas, mas do, do, do Pedro Vivo e meu é um... É, é um, aqui é, é um caseiro. Fone, é o um fone de... É solução caseira. De, solução caseira, né? Proletários, né? Servidor público. Exatamente, exatamente. Hum. It's a podcast microphone. I had to buy. Hi. Professor Hi, Pierre. How are you? Hi. Which, in which part of the world are you? I am in Mallorca, Spain. Ah, how nice, how nice. My, my home. Uh -huh, how nice, good. <laughs> <clears throat> I wrote to my friends in Malaga and uh, mm -hmm. they said that uh, uh, in spite of the, anyhow, the high level of, uh, of, 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 of uh, what's happening in, in Spain, uh, in, in Malaga, it's very calm in the sense of uh, In, uh, of the disease. Is that correct? Uh, also for Mallorca? Yes, we are fortunate that we have one of the lowest uh, incidents and, and impact of the pandemic, but still, it's, it's still very, very bad here in, uh -huh. for the country. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have friends. I mean, I wrote to friends in Malaga, in Madrid, in Valencia, and in. Uh, Uh, it's not Saragossa, it is anyhow, not Salamanca, not Saragossa, I forgot the other. Everybody is fine, everybody is fine, thank God, yeah. May I say just one thing about the chat? If we put a, um, the messages to go to all panelists and attendees, then everybody can see them and they can interact, so the audience can interact. Correct. If we send messages to only the panelists, then only us can see it. So for any general comment or question or message, it would be good to put all panelists and attendees for every message. Correct. So you, you, you're saying for, for this conference, we need to, to do some conf special configuration, Marga? No, just when you, when you see the message box, you can, uh -huh. you can drop down and you can okay. see all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Mm -hmm. okay. And that way the message goes to everybody that's in the mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Professor Bruno, uh, Pierre Bruno is following us. I'm here. Okay, <laughs> excellent, Professor. Are you, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm fine. And nice to meet you again, to hear you again. <laughs> It's a pleasure. So, why do you think you start, uh, Pedro? Yes, let's start. Yeah, yeah please. So, Uh, so, so <clears throat> uh, I believe uh, we can start. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we are honored to, to host this seminar, Science Diplomacy in COVID-19, Challenges and Opportunities, as a side of, of event of Inside Innovation in Science Diplomacy School. Uh, 
held last year at the uh, University of Sao Paulo. The, the seminar is organized by Institute of International Relations, Institute of the Advanced Studies and Political Science Department. I'd like to thank Professor Janina, Professor Aris Plonsky for supporting, and Professor Lorena Barberia, who is offered the, the Zoom's platform for the seminar. Uh, we are also in Edis YouTube, please follow us. I'm pleased uh, that some of the former participants of the Inside are in attendance today. Uh, that is not the case present of an impressive curriculum of Professor, uh, Professor Marga, Dr. Marga. I wanted to emphasize that she is a young global leader of uh, World Economic Forum and uh, faculty member of the Inside. Thanks a lot, Marga, for, to accept our invitation. Let's take about 40 minutes for the conference and then we open for QNS, q and &A. Please use the chat for making questions or suggestions during the conference. Before I pass, I pass the word for, to Marga, uh, Dr. Pedro Ivo, my partner in the executive coordination of the school, will give some information. Please, Pedro, uh, the floor is for, is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amancio, and a big thanks to Marga for bringing the relevant uh, topic of the moment to discussion here at uh, Inside uh, SP. I uh, am equally happy to see many of the alumni of uh, Inside SP and also the lecturers, some of the lecturers uh, among the audience uh, today. Um, and I'm also too happy to see new names, meaning that the inside SP community is growing. And I think that's the, the aim. Um, three very quick uh, points I would like to, to mention here. First, uh, well, it happened three months ago, but I think it's important that uh, we officially acknowledge the fact that our dear friend, Professor Ari Plonsky, was uh, awarded with the uh, traje Trajectory Innovation Prize of the uh, USP Innovation Agency. And uh, well, I think it's, well, it's, uh, the award uh, is uh, with regards to his, let's say, career, which was devoted to innovation and innovation policies. So I think it's a well-deserved, uh, uh, Professor Ari. I'm very uh, honored to, we are very honored to have you as part of the executive committee of Inside uh, SP. Well, second, um, what uh, I, I'd like to mention is that, uh, well, our Sao Paulo framework of innovation diplomacy, I'm very happy to say that it has been very well received by uh, the international community. Uh, some uh, governments have uh, approached us to say that they are using the framework as reference for their national innovation uh, policy. Uh, and uh, I think that's a matter of pride to all of us. Uh, it's a document we crafted uh, together. And uh, I would like to ask you to keep on the good work in promoting the Sao Paulo framework of innovation diplomacy, promoting debates around it, writing about it. So I think so we can uh, further spread the word about this uh, document, which is a real uh, major milestone in the recent, still recent uh, re uh, history of uh, innovation diplomacy. Finally, uh, last but uh, certainly not least, I would like, I have the honor to announce that the second edition of Inside SP is going to uh, happen from 3rd to 7th of August uh, this year. Given the current uh, circumstances and uh, all the, let's say, the uh, limitations that it entails, we'll uh, have the edition 100% online. But similar to last year's edition, we are organizing a set of uh, panels and also lectures and also practic practical activities uh, with the students. Uh, so that we can further, uh, let's say, uh, promote the discussion on science and uh, innovation diplomacy. Uh, we uh, will be soon, um, actually by middle of uh, next month, start the application process for uh, the school. Uh, we, this time, will aim at having 50 Brazilian students and 50 
uh, international uh, students. And uh, well, I cannot at this moment uh, disclose uh, the program, but uh, as a teaser, let me say that uh, Professor Sumita Dutra, who is uh, from the Cornell University, and he is the one who created the Global Innovation Index, he has accepted to give one of the lectures to our school this year. And uh, please follow up, uh, follow us up on our uh, website and also on our social media to have uh, more information and more details about the program uh, inside SD program uh, for this year. So now uh, I think I've said enough. So let's now uh, move on to Marga. Marga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muito um, obrigada. Uh, it's a pleasure to reconnect with, with you, um, Professor Amantio and Pedro Ivo and, and everybody uh, involved in the school. It was a fantastic um, event last year. I see many of the participants uh, in, the, in the chat, so I'm very glad that so many of you are coming back to this uh, side event and also for the announcement of the next edition. So for anyone that did not participate last year and is now in the, in the audience, I encourage you to, to apply as soon as the applications go, go out um, next month. So um, it's a pleasure for me to, to give a little bit of um, analysis and, and discussion about the situation uh, that we have globally. Of course, we, we have a, a global pandemic that has many science and health diplomacy dimensions. So it was a good opportunity for us to, uh, to analyze and have a bit of a discussion around this, this current topic that is almost providing us with a life case study, if you will, on, on many of the aspects of science, health, innovation, technology, diplomacy that we have been um, uh, dealing with. And um, so it will be a bit of an, an overview of science diplomacy for the um, people in the audience that did not attend the school last year, but uh, we will also focus on the, on the topic at hand. And let me also wish everybody uh, health and, and hopefully everybody is uh, in, uh, safe and, and healthy and your families uh, anywhere in the world that you are. So I will um, share my screen now. Hopefully this works. This is always the critical moment. And okay, is this working? Amantio? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, you can see. Perfect. <laughs> I just wanted Thank some you. feedback Thank to ensure um, are working. We're working, everything is as, as should. So um, I'll just tell you a, a bit about me and, and, and who am I and, and what my work has been in, in science diplomacy. Um, as I said, a bit of an introduction and an overview of science diplomacy for those who might not be so familiar with the concept. Um, and then we'll talk about COVID-19 and, and, and how science diplomacy is, is extremely relevant for, for this uh, scenario that we're living um, right now. And also uh, think a little bit about the future. So what kind of world are we going to get after this? And uh, what are the implications for uh, geopolitics and, and the world order and the place for science and health and innovation in this uh, new world? So uh, just a little bit about me. I am from Spain. I'm from Mallorca, where I'm uh, right now, um, but I've had a career all over the, the world. I've, I've been privileged and, and fortunate to, to work both on the scientific uh, side, but also on the policy and, and diplomacy world. So I have a PhD in molecular biology uh, in Australia, uh, but after that I switch and, and uh, after, for my postdoc and, and career afterwards, I um, entered the world of international policy and diplomacy, first through the United Nations in New York, and then I moved to Washington DC for um, the last five years I spent at the AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy, which was the first um, institution that was created to, um, to really bring together the community and, and put the definitions and the frameworks around science diplomacy. And I will talk a little bit about those in a, in a minute. Um, so as a scientist for me, it was uh, very um, unknown. The, 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 the word diplomacy never um, seemed to be um, to, to go with science at all during my studies. And I, I think many of the, you know, many people that are um, in the audience and, and many of the, the, the students and, and scientists that, that we interact with, they don't have a sense of how science and diplomacy can go together because we um, are immersed in 
silos, right? Our education is always separate. And until very recently, for a science student, uh, you, or especially in the natural sciences, um, you would never cross in your faculty or your department or your school somebody studying international law or political science or international relations. And so these two worlds have been separated in, in theory for, for a long time, but not in practice. And so science diplomacy is something that has a long tradition, but only recently we have given it this, um, this name, this concept, this framework, and that allows us to, um, to make it operational. So the first time that I heard about diplomacy, uh, I like to put this quote from, from Winston Churchill and, and, um, and Henry Wooten, who was an English diplomat, about how science, uh, how, dip how diplomacy is basically the opposite of science, right? Diplomacy is about getting others to do what you want, but in a nice way so they don't realize that you are leading them towards that, that goal. Um, and and it, it, for me, it had to do with um, secrecy or with uh, protocol or with uh, non-transparency, with uh, discretion and tactics and negotiation. And science was something that was for me open, international, transparent, collaborative. Um, and so for me, those two worlds were opposite until I um, crossed to the other side. Uh, at that time, it seemed to me that diplomacy or politics or anything that was outside of my little bubble in, in, in the scientific academic world, uh, it was very foreign. It was, it was um, not something that I could directly relate to. And so for me, I thought science should have an impact in the world. But how can we scientists have that impact if we don't really know how the world works, right? And that is the domain of international relations and, and, and studying um, how policy works, how a law is made, and how the public policy cycle works. So when scientists, we say we want to have an impact in policy, many times we don't know what policy is and how policy is made. So for me, the key turning point in, in my career was to, to bring these two worlds together and help the scientists understand this other world of public policy, diplomacy, and international relations, and, and basically global affairs. And also to uh, help put more science and technology and innovation and health, these subjects that perhaps are not so common in diplomatic academies or the foreign service. And so how could, can we bring these two worlds together in a, is now the domain of science diplomacy. And for 10 years, we've had this um, field or this new um, subject of, of area of study. So um, just very quickly, um, diplomacy is, is really an art, right? It's the art of conducting international relations through negotiations, treaties, alliances, in a way that is peaceful, in a way that is non-coercive, that is non-military. Um, uh, so it is about um, managing international relations in, in a peaceful way. When a country um, conducts diplomacy, it is based on foreign policy strategy. That is, every country defines and designs their foreign policy. And then diplomacy and diplomats are the ones who go out and execute that uh, foreign policy. So basically it is the boundary between the domestic and the international environment. But this traditional definition of, di of diplomacy really is changing and very fast is impacted by the global challenges and globalization. And, and in the last few decades, we've seen how diplomacy is no longer just the domain of nation states, right? So we have globalization intensifying all of these cross boundary interactions. Climate change is bringing us new problems that need to be addressed collectively, right? And, and all of these threats are transboundary, meaning that no country can solve them on its own. And the pandemic now is accelerating our understanding of that very well. So, in the 21st century, we are um, uh, confronted with a new uh, set of issues that, um, that uh, develop a new agenda, right? A new international agenda. And those new types of diplomacies are emerging to uh, precisely address those transboundary challenges that perhaps no traditional diplomacy um, um, can alone address. And those include health diplomacy, digital diplomacy, disaster diplomacy, and of course, science diplomacy. And there are many of those new fields or flavors of, of diplomacy. And that is also bringing new actors. So it's not only, as I was saying, the, the, the role of nation states to conduct uh, diplomacy. Now we are seeing uh, the increase in, in importance of non-state actors, of cities, of subnational governments, states, um, 
as well as private companies, transnational uh, corporations, tech diplomacy, and different groupings and geopolitical um, configurations that are uh, changing very fast in response to these new challenges. So as I was saying, for me, when, when I first learned about diplomacy as a scientist, it seemed completely opposite. And these differences between the worlds of science, the culture, the values of, of science and diplomacy are very well described in this book that I recommend by Darren Copeland, who is a former Canadian diplomat who wrote this book, Guerrilla Diplomacy, which is fantastic to really juxtapose these two worlds of science and diplomacy and, and um, to really understand why they seem to come from such different um, domains but then as we enter in in the the world of uh, the 21st century challenges we obviously need them both to to work together so science is what we call a source of soft power so soft power is a term coined by uh, professor joseph nye um, of harvard kennedy school and and he basically di uh, differentiates between hard power and soft power we were talking in the in the beginning about how diplomacy is about conducting negotiations and relations uh, in a way that is non-violent. For instance, hard power is about using military force, is about using coercions and payments and sanctions and embargoes. There are many ways that you can force somebody to do something, but you can probably gain more if you are using um, things that they value about you so that is the power of attraction. So you can use a culture, you can use arts, you can use music, you can use education, you can use science. For instance, countries that have the best uh, educational and scientific enterprise attract the best minds uh, of the world. They want to go study in those universities and, and uh, conduct research in those places. So that is a pole of attraction that you can use to gain a competitive advantage um, in, in the world without having to force anyone to do anything. So this is, um, so science is part of this um, soft power um, uh, coined by Joseph Nye. And in the 20th century, we see very clearly how science can act as this bridge and to be this um, you know, first approach when countries, especially when they come out of war or uh, after long periods of conflict, we see that the first agreements and the first um, collaborations that uh, can be formed are scientific agreements because science is uh, more neutral and it's easy to agree to do science together for countries, right? Uh, it's more tricky to perhaps uh, agree on human rights and other more delicate issues, but science is, is, a, is a thing that's probably in the interest of both to work together. And so we can see many examples of uh, countries coming back from conflict and signing scientific agreements, such as the US and China or, or with Japan. Um, but also we have um, the EU and, and in, in, uh, in Europe, the construction of CERN, which is the, um, the Large Hadron Collider, very well known for, uh, for being the place where the, the Higgs boson was uh, found. Uh, that laboratory was built after World War II to bring together the East and the West um, former enemies in, in Europe and uh, help the physicists and the scientists from both sides to work together and start building those uh, collaborations to advance physics, but also the, those collaborations, um, for instance, allowed uh, the first contact between uh, Israeli and German scientists after, after World War II. Um, also, we have uh, examples of collaboration in space that cannot happen on Earth. So in, in, in the Cold War, we have the US-Soviet Union space collaboration, and, and it was very symbolic because there's this picture called Handshake in Space where the Soviet and the uh, American astronauts um, basically show collaboration on, on, in orbit. That's not possible on Earth at that point. So it is really uh, symbolic of the value and, and the importance of continuing science collaboration despite political or, or, or other differences. And today we have a modern uh, example of that, similar to CERN, that brings countries together. In this case, it's in the Middle East, in Jordan. Uh, Sesame is, is um, a synchrotron that brings together um, 10 uh, Middle Eastern countries that as we know, they might not be in the best uh, political relations, but they agree to uh, bring their scientists together to, um, to cooperate in this scientific facility in Jordan. And so 
as I was saying, science diplomacy was not formalized as a concept, even though it was a long practice, as we have just seen, um, until the, this landmark report called New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy. And this was done by the Royal Society in the UK, which is the Academy of Sciences in the UK, and the AAAS in, in Washington, DC. And so the definition of science diplomacy that was put forward at the time was that science is a common ground to build international partnerships, manage common resources, address uh, shared challenges, and improve political relations between nations. This um, definition has evolved uh, very much and, and, and many of our colleagues here, Professor Ruffini and others, uh, have uh, worked to, to evolve and, and improve this uh, definition. But at the basic level, we can say that science diplomacy has three pillars. The first one would be about how the diplomatic apparatus and the diplomatic system can help advance science. The second pillar would be how science can inform diplomatic relations. And uh, in the same way that we talk about evidence-informed policy, we can also talk about evidence-informed diplomacy, especially at the multilateral level uh, in negotiating um, in international treaties or managing um, uh, global commons that have no uh, national jurisdiction. And we'll see some of that in a, in a minute. And then the third pillar of science diplomacy is about uh, the, the conflict space, right? How can science um, and, and scientific collaboration uh, can be uh, a bridge for uh, building or repairing relationships, uh, political relationships, when those are uh, strained. So in the Diplomacy for Science pillar, we have uh, very um, visible examples, for instance, large research infrastructures. Those are scientific facilities, but underlying those facilities, there is a diplomatic treaty. And I found that, uh, I mean, for me as a scientist in my, my previous life and many of my colleagues, we didn't really know that, science, that, that those scientific facilities had a diplomatic agreement underneath, right? So we thought scientists would just go and, and, and observe at the telescope or uh, you know, conduct experiments in, at, a, at this um, synchrotron that we were talking about. These large facilities really require a diplomatic agreement. Basically, the diplomats have to come together and decide who participates in this uh, facility, who funds it, who can, so who, who can, what are the rules of participation? How many hours can you have depending on what you pay? Uh, what happens if you don't pay? So can you be a full member, an observer? All of those things are written off as bureaucracy many times by the scientists. And we're like, oh, this is boring bureaucracy paperwork. We, we don't want to deal with this. We just want to do the science. But without the, 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 the key role of the diplomats uh, negotiating these agreements, those uh, facilities would not exist. And it's not only about big science, it's also about uh, getting a research permit, getting a visa. So if you are a scientist that want to go to another country to do research, you need a visa, probably. So those are really important roles for embassies and consulates to, to allow uh, scientific mobility around the world. And this is not to say that science cooperation has to be mediated by the government. Obviously, we know that science collaboration happens um, organically and scientists collaborate with anyone in the world um, without major problem. Of course, now that we have the internet, it's not even um, necessary to travel to, to, to cooperate. So it's not that all government, all, all scientific collaboration has to be mediated by governments, but there are very important instances like the, like the ones I just described, where the uh, intervention and the support of the government embassies is ex extremely important for successful partnerships. And here you have uh, a number of these facilities, CERN, as I was mentioning the European Southern Observatory in Chile, um, the International Space Station, obviously, uh, and Sesame, as I, as I mentioned. All of those are scientific and diplomatic uh, facilities, if you will, or infrastructures. So the second pillar of science diplomacy is what we call science informing diplomacy. And the most, uh, obviously, clear examples are uh, for instance, getting an agreement on a global common, for instance, managing uh, the high seas that have no um, uh, national jurisdiction or getting a climate agreement. Climate change is a global problem that we cannot solve individually as a nation, so we have to come together to address it. And so after World War II, we see an increase on all of these um, international agreements, um, most of them under the um, United Nations uh, conventions and, and frameworks basically designed to manage common interests. So we as a planet, we can manage our common spaces uh, together. 
and there are many of those uh, treaties, deep sea, outer space, Antarctica, the high seas. These are all global commons that belong to no one and they have to be managed collectively. And here we have an example of the, of the high seas. You see the uh, dark blue is the parts of the ocean that belong to a national jurisdiction, but most of the other uh, map, you see the, the light blue, is the high seas. And these are uh, two thirds of the ocean has actually no national jurisdiction and needs to be managed together. And so this is the challenge. How do we, um, if you think about the planet, we have 30% of the planet that belongs to somebody, but then 70% of the planet that does not belong to one, to, to a particular country. And so it is a huge challenge for us to, to manage those spaces together. And one of the most uh, successful and symbolic examples of this is Antarctica. So the Antarctic Treaty was signed in 1959. Uh, it was the height of the Cold War, so it's even more important that it was successful. And, and this was the last continent that had not been yet colonized and there were no human activity, but there were many claims, territorial claims from different countries that wanted to have a portion, a slice of, of Antarctica. But thanks to science collaboration in 1958, in the International Geophysical Year, scientists went to Antarctica and set up this, um, the, these facilities and laboratories and research infrastructures in Antarctica. And they realized that in a place that is so harsh and hostile and cold, it is really much better to work together rather than everybody having their own piece of the, of the continent. And so Antarctica became this global uh, national, uh, international laboratory for studying climate change. And, and, and uh, obviously today it is our most important um, sensor or, or sentinel for, for climate change. And it has um, remained for 60 years as this global common managed for um, managed by all of us uh, in the interest of peace and, and science. And hopefully it remains um, for many more decades uh, like this. Um, and then it is not just about scientific agreements being successful, right? So it is, um, it is very symbolic, I think, as well, that one of these scientific diplomatic agreements, like the Montreal Protocol, this is the, the, the agreement that managed to close the ozone hole layer, as you know, um, we, um, in the 80s, we had a, um, a very important problem in, on Antarctica. There was a hole in the ozone layer. And that was caused by this um, chlorophore, chloro, CFCs, I never know the word. Uh, the CFCs are chemicals that are refrigerants and uh, they were emitted by uh, spray cans. Remember those spray cans that had CFC in the, in the label, uh, but also were used for cars, for uh, fridges, for basically our modern common living, uh, the, 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 the common, our, our modern standards of living in many ways were uh, enabled by those uh, technologies, right? So when the scientists warned that there was this problem, that, that the CFCs were causing a hole in the ozone layer, um, of course, governments had to get on board to uh, decide, so what can we do? So one of the, um, the approaches was to ban these chemicals, ban the production and the manufacturing of these chemicals. But of course, that meant that a lot of industries would not be happy because they would basically be out of business because the, those manufacturers were very powerful. So the solution was to align the science, the politics and the industry. And that, you know, three-partite agreement was what really allowed this agreement to be successful because industry was able to innovate and leapfrog and uh, produce um, non-harming um, substances and replace the CFCs that were causing the, the ozone layer. So that really shows how important it is to have all stakeholders on board for when we talk about science diplomacy and science-based agreements, it is not just about science and the diplomatic sphere, it is also about industry. And when we talk about climate change, we see it is much harder for industry to fully uh, get on board to, um, to phase out um, fossil fuels and, and, and really achieve uh, the, um, the, the energy transition that, that we need in order to meet the, the Paris Agreement goals. And, and speaking of Paris Agreement, obviously that was another very important uh, success for climate diplomacy that in this uh, moment we, we see it not, um, being, not, not, not progressing at the speed that we should. From 2015, many uh, geopolitical scenarios have changed. But in that case, it was a way, it was a, a, another landmark moment of getting all countries together 
195 nations to sign to commit to climate action. And the latest and the most now, I think, widespread agenda that we can all um, identify with um, is the, the SDGs, right? The UN Sustainable Development Agenda that really provides a framework for meeting our global challenges. And if you, if you look at those goals, science is present in all of them, right? From um, managing the oceans, from um, um, providing clean energy, health, uh, well-being, uh, infrastructures, and, and clean water, and so forth. And the third and, and very quickly last uh, pillar of science diplomacy is this idea of science being a bridge when there is conflict or political strain between uh, nations. So I was fortunate to, um, to spend a big part of my career working to build bridges between um, the U.S. Uh, scientific community and the Cuban scientific community. As you know, the U.S. and Cuba had been uh, for many decades uh, in, a, in a diplomatic um, freeze. Um, when I started working at AAAS, um, there were no diplomatic relations in 2013 between the U.S. and Cuba for many decades. What that means is that scientists cannot work together as easily, and they cannot work together on the common challenges. So when you have two countries that are so close together, like the U.S. and Cuba, they face the same challenges. They, they, they face um, threats of hurricanes, of tropical storms. They face uh, infectious disease, tropical diseases that are coming up in latitude because of climate change, you have shared oceans and shared ecosystems that really require the management of all the countries involved. And having this diplomatic conflict really um, um, impairs the collaboration that needs to happen between the scientists in those countries. So I worked on bringing the scientists together. And um, when the, in 2015, the diplomatic relations were reopened between the US and Cuba, as I described in the previous, uh, about the previous agreements in, in the 20th century, science was the first agreement that was signed. So health, environment, different uh, oceans, different topics were put on the table because the scientists were ready to put uh, something on the table to be signed as a, as a sign of reapproachment between the, good between the two countries. So that's why it's extremely important to have the scientific um, collaboration and communication to, to, to not have barriers to that. Because no matter how the countries are politically at that point, if you continue maintaining the scientific uh, uh, connection, uh, then it will be much easier to, to come back when the political circumstances improve. And so how we apply all of this to COVID-19, right? We, we see very uh, in the headlines, and, and it, it is incredibly um, almost overwhelming for us working in science diplomacy that now all of the headlines of all the major newspapers are about science diplomacy. It is, it is like a life case study, as I was saying. And so COVID-19 is bringing us changes in the scientific world and in the political and geopolitical order. And those responses that we've seen have been quite opposite. So COVID-19 arrives in a time of very, uh, quite a low, multi a low point for multilateralism, right? I was talking about 2015 and the Paris Agreement and the time that uh, we really seemed to have the world on track for this climate action and this collective um, action in, in, in to address global challenges. But in the last five years, this situation has changed. And so we are faced with a number of uh, um, rivalries and geopolitical challenges that make that, that made the conditions not the optimal for the arrival of a pandemic. And so from the science perspective, what we have seen, it is an unprecedented collaboration. We have seen scientists uh, leave aside all of their authorship and kind of the, the you know, the, the competitions and, and just work together, single focus on finding uh, vaccines and treatments and, and understanding um, the, the, the virus. It is the, 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 the fastest characterized virus in history. It is amazing how so quickly we were able to understand this disease and we are still understanding it. We are not done. Every day we, have, we find something new about it, but it is really remarkable the speed um, at which science uh, has worked together. And this is in stark contrast as the New York Times uh, headline that I, that I show you here but uh, it, it said that while political leaders have locked their borders, scientists have shattered theirs and created a global collaboration unlike any in history. And so when we see the response of uh, the global leaders who resorted to unilateral actions, uh, closing borders, 
and um, really struggling to incorporate evidence-based um, advice into, into their responses. And so I'm not going to go into each of them, but um, basically the countries that had more robust and the best traditions of science advice and science policy interface, for instance, the US or the UK, um, they were not the countries that more easily and, and, and rapidly incorporated this, sci this scientific advice. And this really shows us that uh, it is extremely important to have scientific infrastructures within government agencies, have science advice, have experts, and, and have this uh, access to, um, to expertise. But also, if you, don't, if you have leaders who don't want to hear this advice and don't want to use these scientific uh, interfaces, the science policy interfaces, then how, how good are these structures, right? So it is really bringing us so many uh, examples and, and as I was saying, case studies of science advice because it is not enough to have those structures in place. You have to have them perhaps earlier on, right? Many, many governments created these emergency science committees, but how, how much time was wasted in, in bringing together the experts and scrambling to, to put together a committee rather than having a long-standing uh, office or uh, a mechanism of science advice uh, already inside uh, the government. And that means all of the government agencies, all of the ministries, and especially the foreign ministry, which uh, is the domain that concerns us in, in science diplomacy. Another interesting angle is the role of this, um, the multilateral organizations and the supranational bodies that have been heavily criticized by many countries. And it is um, interesting to, to also explore this part because I think um, those organizations don't really, um, we, we haven't done a good job of communicating how they work. So for instance, WHO and, and basically all the UN agencies, they are, um, informed by member states. So it is not like a world government that dictates that this should be done in a pandemic. It is a secretariat that responds to a uh, group of countries <clears throat> called member states. And they, these countries dictate uh, the, the, the work and the, the, uh, the work program and the objectives and the strategies that these uh, UN agencies will follow. So it is uh, perhaps a misconception and, and perhaps we need to do a better job of explaining that a multilateral body, it is, it's really a member state body. It is not a separate entity that says um, this country should do this or that, right? So it is um, uh, the same with the EU, right? How the, um, so we've, we've of course heard a lot of uh, criticism of the EU and the role of, um, of, of the EU in, in, in responding to, to the pandemic in Europe and how it was uh, responding late and uncoordinated and uh, basically showing a lack of solidarity. And so again, we have to understand how these um, systems are created. So the EU is based on treaties and those treaties by the member states basically give the EU powers to do things or not, right? And that is called competences. So if the EU has competences in uh, a particular domain, they can act and they can um, legislate and they can impose measures across the entire EU. But for instance, health is not an EU competence. It's a shared competence and um, the health systems and the health response, it is uh, still a competence of the member states. So it is not so easy for the EU to rapidly implement a unilateral and coordinated um, response. And that has to come from the member states, from all the health ministries, from all the foreign ministries to come together. And that really comes to in, in the science diplomacy space. Um, for instance, the EU does not have a strong yet foreign policy, uh, common foreign policy, common foreign and security policy, uh, as much as it has a common science and research space, right? So many of you know the Horizon 2020 programs and many of the research uh, uh, budget of the EU is actually open to any member state and open to the world. So science and diplomacy in the EU are different at the different levels. Research is a, is a um, common competence and is a very strong uh, mechanism of integration. But foreign policy, each country, each member state likes to keep their own foreign policy, which is understandable. And they like to keep their bilateral relations uh, and ge uh, geopolitical configurations differently. And so that is the challenge. And I think understanding better how these 
multilateral organizations work will allow us to then identify ways to improve them and perhaps make, make them more agile and, and, and faster in, in, in response. But I think it's an important point that we, that we must um, understand and maybe do a better job in, in communicating how, how they work. And so the, the headlines of this um, pandemic are giving us uh, so, much exam so many examples of these uh, geopolitical reconfigurations of this uh, use of hard and soft power. Uh, we see China now um, basically um, showing this uh, soft power and presenting uh, itself as a responsible power that wants to help other countries once it has overcome uh, the pandemic. We also see the challenges um, that countries with, that are under sanctions or um, different types of, uh, of international embargoes and sanction regimes are struggling to import um, the uh, basic uh, products and, and, and protective equipment, right? So this is uh, one of the, the reasons the, um, the UN Secretary General called for a global ceasefire and a global uh, suspension of sanctions to allow all countries to respond to the pandemic and for at least temporarily leave aside all of those uh, conflicts and, and, and political um, and geopolitical um, situations in order to allow the, for, the, for the best response. And, and this is really rooted in the idea that uh, if one country, if, if we stop the pandemic in one country, but we leave it grow in one, that country will probably spread it again um, to the whole world, right? So it is not uh, effective to have a partial um, strategy if we don't help everybody, every country to, to, to eliminate the pandemic. And we have the example of smallpox that was eradicated uh, because of the, the WHO uh, global vaccination campaign that basically vaccinated every single person in the world. And that means every country committed to vaccinating the entire population so there will be no other outbreak that could, uh, if, if one country or one section of the population would be um, left uh, unvaccinated, uh, that would then uh, spread the pandemic again. And so um, it is now a time that countries are showing this um, soft power. Uh, Cuba has a long tradition of medical and health diplomacy, deploying uh, medical brigades to help other countries. Um, and then we have other um, scenarios that are worth mentioning, for instance, Taiwan. Taiwan had a very good response to the pandemic, but they, are, they complain that they're not allowed to share those best practices and lessons to the world because under the One China policy, Taiwan is not allowed to be a full member of WHO or to have uh, direct bilateral relations with certain countries. And so we are seeing so many dimensions of, uh, of the pandemic that are uh, squarely within the science and, 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 and geopolitics um, right now. And, and as, I, as I was saying, there's a, a big effort in documenting all of this. So one of the organizations that is, that is doing that is INSA, the International Network of Government Science Advice. They are documenting how each of the countries are responding. What are the science advice mechanisms that are they using? Are they using evidence-based approaches or not? And so if you go to the INSA, it's INSA or uh, COVID, um, it, is, it is a tracker, a policy tracker of all of the responses from a science advice and a science diplomacy angle uh, that countries are taking. So how do we boost science diplomacy? How do we move forward? And, and, and how can we strengthen these interfaces uh, so we can avoid the next pandemic? And, and that applies to, to every global challenge, um, not just health. Um, so there are many countries and, 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 and groups that are uh, starting to have science diplomacy strategies at the highest levels of government. Uh, I was involved um, in um, devising the science diplomacy strategy for the EU, working with the former commissioner uh, Moedas. And basically, um, he made a very big push for a kind of a top-down approach for the EU to use science uh, to, to increase its presence and its uh, global standing in the world. So the EU as a global power, uh, how we can use the scientific um, enterprise relationships and uh, all our scientific programs to, to really um, uh, promote uh, the values of the EU around the world and help address global challenges. And um, this came also with a very important um, um, result, which was that 
and the science diplomacy became also a, um, a topic for research in the EU. So in the Horizon 2020 pro uh, program, which is the framework program for research in the EU, uh, for the first time, science diplomacy became one of the items. So um, three projects um, that um, I'm fortunate that to have been involved very closely and continue to be in involved very closely uh, in them, uh, three projects were selected to conduct this uh, research to breach uh, the academic, the most theoretical um, aspects, but also the practical aspects of science diplomacy. And uh, they have really done an amazing job at creating and, and galvanizing a science diplomacy community, not just in Europe, but uh, from all around the world, both on the academic side, but also uh, diplomatic academies are involved uh, and, and many other types of um, institutions. So I, I recommend, if you don't know the projects um, yet, I recommend that you check them out, sciencediplomacy.com. EU. And then at the national level, this has also, um, we have also seen an increase in, um, in higher level strategies. For instance, Spain in 2015 published uh, a science diplomacy oh. strategy together, the science ministry and the foreign yeah. ministry came together for, for uh, devising this, um, posso, this strategy. And then um, the, oops, sorry, there's somebody. And then as part of this um, European project, S4D4C, that I show you, um, Spain also uh, launched this Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy that outlines a set of uh, principles and guidelines for countries willing to strengthen their science diplomacy um, actions. The same with Panama. Uh, it was the first Latin American country to publish a science diplomacy strategy. Here you can, you can see it uh, by the, for, the former um, foreign minister and vice president. Uh, and, and she, she was a champion, basically, she wanted to have uh, to position Panama as, as a scientific uh, uh, power, right? And using the strategic uh, position of Panama and logistic capabilities, biodiversity, uh, and the fact that 80%, uh, I think, of the country is ocean. So what are the strengths in, in science and environment that Panama can help to position itself and, and, and increase the global standing? So you can read that strategy. and. Um, Obviously, uh, a lot of the, the work that needs to be done is to strengthen uh, the scientific capacity and advice and, and interfaces within uh, foreign ministries and, and diplomatic academies. So um, I have been working with many of you in the, in the audience, uh, I see, in, uh, in Mexico, in Panama, in Chile, and uh, many of the, of the Latin American countries that are really taking this up um, very, very seriously. And of course, of course, Brazil and, 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 and Sao Paulo. So here's the strategy that uh, Pedro Ivo mentioned in the opening, the Sao Paulo Framework of Innovation Diplomacy that came out of the summer school last year. And it is really a fantastic document that is, uh, as he said, being uh, used as a model and example for, for others. And, and so what we can learn from this is that there are national strategies, but also increasingly there are subnational and other types of actors at different levels that are engaging in science diplomacy. So obviously a Sao Paulo strategy is a state of Brazil. Um, it has a science, it's a scientific superpower, right? It's like the engine of science in Brazil. So there are some particular elements of it that uh, warrant its own strategy. Um, the same is happening in Mexico. So Mexico City and the Mexico City government uh, has created the first uh, science policy fellowship for scientists to be immersed in different government agencies and uh, to really boost this science, uh, this uh, city level um, uh, diplom science diplomacy and, and tech diplomacy and climate diplomacy resilience. As we know, cities are increasingly acting as uh, global actors. Uh, in Spain, we have uh, Barcelona, which um, uh, is now uh, promoted by a group, SciTech DiploHub, uh, promoting uh, Barcelona as, a, as also a science um, diplomacy hub. Um, so how do we train um, science diplomacy? There is no one way. Um, obviously, there are many different um, aspects to be covered. So when um, I was at AAAS, we developed this uh, methodology that basically is not just about teaching the theory and practice and history and, and frameworks of science diplomacy. It is also about gaining the skills. So the, mostly by experiential learning, as Pedro was also mentioned, uh, it's very important to have exercises. So diplomats in training, they all go through all these different um, simulations. You've seen perhaps Model UN and different ways of 
uh, almost um, you know having real world scenarios to practice those skills and so uh, teaching uh, how to communicate science to policymakers negotiation communication across cultures and and and, and sectors um, finding the language that appeals to all your audiences and and obviously networking so it's very useful for scientists to experience this uh, uh, immersion, this, uh, the immersion in the ecosystem of science diplomacy, for instance, visiting embassies and international organizations. And uh, for instance, in, in DC, we, we used to go to NASA, for instance, right, and see how NASA works globally um, in, in, in basically every program around the world. So it is very important for um, young people to, to that it, that's interested in bridging this divide to, to gain those skills at the same time at the same time that we build capacity in the foreign ministries and governments, the science policy interface uh, structures and, and mechanisms that many institutions are, are doing, like the, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, which is also an inter-American um, intergovernmental uh, organization um, dealing with global change in the, in the Western Hemisphere, now has launched a science policy fellowship at the hemispheric level. And that makes all the sense to bring together uh, people working on the same problem in different countries. They can uh, then work as a cohort and, and exchange lessons and, and, um, and work together across countries because obviously all of these challenges are transboundary in nature. If you would like to know more about these um, mechanisms that I talk about, about these programs, they are all collected in this report that uh, we published in um, 2017, Connecting Science to Policy Around the World. It's basically a landscape analysis of different mechanisms for, for connecting scientists and policy around the world. And let me finish by saying um, sometimes there are some misconceptions about science diplomacy, and I like to kind of prevent some of the questions that come um, so I already said that science diplomacy is not just a domain of a national government. There are city and state level actors, there are supranational organizations. Uh, the role of scientific societies, academies of science, they're very important to, to act as a, as a neutral bridge between academia and government. So it is it's a very good um, model if you want to have, for instance, a science policy fellowship, to have a, a scientific body like a uh, an academy, for instance, or a scientific uh, organization, uh, yeah, like um, the AAAS, or in Brazil you have the SPBC, right, uh, that can um, mediate and bridge the two, the two communities. And there are so many different ways now of doing diplomacy that are, that are heavily impacted by, by technology and innovation. For instance, uh, there are ambassadors, like Denmark has an ambassador to uh, Silicon Valley, right? So now the appointment of uh, diplomatic missions to no longer just the national um, sovereign nation, but to uh, an innovation hub like is Silicon Valley, for, for example. Also, we're not talking about scientists becoming politicians, although some do and they're great. There was an article in the New York Times about uh, Angela Merkel, um, the success of Germany's um, uh, response in the pandemic being because she was a scientist. Uh, we don't know how much of that is uh, uh, true, but um, we are not talking about scientists living everything and, and, and becoming politicians and also not politicizing science, right? So it's very important scientists want to be independent and academic freedom is, is the, 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 the most important um, uh, value that we have. So it is not about using scientists as a political instrument. It is, it is really about how science can help inform these uh, discussions and, and, and policies. And uh, at the same time, science cooperation does not equal science diplomacy, right? So there's uh, international science, science cooperation happening all over the world on all sorts of topics and not all of them have a diplomatic uh, implication. So it is not about um, confusing and calling science cooperation, science diplomacy. And we see sometimes this happening and, and confuses. And so um, importantly, finally, it is science does not dictate policy. Scientists don't tell what to do. Scientists provide the evidence, provide the options, and need to communicate very clearly with decision makers, but they do not decide, right? So there are so many competing interests like uh, political, economic, uh, cultural, religious. There are so many different interest that a policymaker and a decision maker needs to take into account when they uh, take a decision. So it is not just about science saying, oh, we need to stop climate change. Here's what we need to do. Yes, but what are all the other uh, sectors? How are we going to uh, make this decision that um, 
our whole society can get on board, not just what the science uh, says. So let's think about what the world we want, right? What, what the world will be after this pandemic and what are the opportunities to really bring science and health and innovation to the center of foreign policy of the multilateral system and uh, innovate and, and, and create the structures that really work for this 21st century challenge. And I cannot um, uh, leave you without talking about leadership. I think a lot of these questions come down to leadership. And uh, I see a lot of women, uh, heads of state doing really well. And I was part of a, of a program that, that precisely tries to do that and to bring more women into the decision-making um, sphere. And this program is called Homeward Bound. It's in Antarctica. And uh, this is where I was able to experience uh, this idea of science for peace and science as a global common by going to Antarctica and uh, sharing an experience with a hundred women from all over the world, all with a scientific background, but with this uh, um, will to create a more collaborative, legacy-minded and um, basically inclusive leadership system uh, than uh, we have right now in, in many countries. If you want to know more, uh, there's a course, online course on science diplomacy that we produce. It's completely free and uh, you, can, you can watch it uh, anytime to expand on any of those issues. And uh, I will send you this presentation so you have uh, the articles and, and some of the um, uh, resources that I, that I mentioned. And finally, I will say that science diplomacy, it is fascinating. I would love for many of you to get involved. For me, it was a, a transforming, transformative journey. I, end up, I ended up in places that I would have never imagined, for instance, in the Vatican, um, on a ship in, off the coast of Italy, in Antarctica, or diving a, um, a C-130 plane on, on the Red Sea. So it really, do, it really brings you uh, to a world that um, you don't really expect, and, and, and it's a career that you create as you go. And so it is, uh, it's a pleasure for me to share this with you, and I hope to see you in August in the, in the course. And uh, muito obrigada, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Marga. Uh, we have a plenty of uh, chat here saying that people was miss, were missing you. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna open up the, the speaker to Professor Ari Plonsky. I don't know if he has some, some comments or question. And uh, the same to uh, Luis Eduard, Luis, uh, Pierre Bruno, Professor Janina, uh, and Pedro again. So please, Professor Ari Plonsky. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't know if I can see my picture, but anyhow, it's not necessary. Uh, Marga, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation. Um, I, I would uh, uh, just make one slight observation and then the question the slight observations is that in the map of antarctica i think uh, uh, we are missing the brazilian laboratory <laughs> uh, and the question is the following uh, nowadays in many countries including in in brazil uh, diplomacy uh, or government uh, is uh, very much oriented to let's say a populist approach and uh, there is a uh, uh, a theory, uh, what's, uh, which is called a deficit model, uh, that uh, attributes public skepticism or hostility to science and technology to the lack of understanding uh, of what science is and, and this division of the world between expert and non-expert. And this uh, has been difficult to overcome. Uh, how would you, uh, because you, you presented the case that in countries where you have strong uh, uh, advisory sciences, uh, it was not enough. But how would you uh, recommend uh, this approach between science and diplomacy in a moment at least, or a period when uh, diplomats uh, are part of this uh, hostility to science and technology? Thank you so much. I think this is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, yes, the deficit model is um, this idea that people don't trust science because scientists don't do enough to communicate. Basically, they need uh, more facts and data thrown at them. And if only people would have more information, they would change their mind, right? So this is the deficit model that has been, of course, debunked uh, 
like um, many, many years ago, but we are seeing it now uh, with um, this pandemic and before with climate change. And so there is no way of just putting more data out and magically people will change their mind. People uh, only listen to data that reaffirms their beliefs. So it is very important that all of this science communication really appeals to people's lives and to people's values, right? So what can we, how can we communicate science, not from the expert to the lay people level, right? How can we change this paradigm and communicate science in a way that matters to people, that improves their lives, that shows that it is a, a, a positive thing for them rather than um, trying to impose something on them that they don't want. So when the facts and the data conflict with their pre-existing beliefs, it has been shown that there is very, very difficult to change them. However, a few days ago, I, I read in the Financial Times, there's a column, I, I can't remember the name um, right now, but it was about the end of the two cultures. You know, the, 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 this idea of um, CPs know that there were two cultures and, and science is kind of separated from society. And now because of this uh, popularity of scientific terms and having all of this scientific now um, basically language being uh, mainstream and front page of the newspapers and in the news, it is now hopefully uh, changing a little bit the perceptions about the importance and the value of science. So it's no longer about scientists in the ivory tower, in the lab, doing something we don't understand that is very difficult, complicated. It's about scientists are looking for a vaccine that will literally get us out of this situation. Like we are not able to move on and get back to normal until we have a solution. And scientists are the ones who will find it. And so the value of scientists and the value of science, I think is now crystal clear. And people recognize that both the public and the politicians. If you remember Donald Trump in a press conference was asking um, scientists and, and the pharma companies to produce a vaccine like right now, can you do it faster? Can you do it faster, right? So it is now we are in the hands of science to get out of this situation. And it is interesting how the politicians who dismissed or did not value science or denied science directly in the past, now they're asking something that science cannot provide because there is no way to produce a vaccine overnight, right? So the importance of understanding the scientific method, understanding what a vaccine is, what is a clinical trial, why we can't just inject people with something that hasn't been proved that it's safe. So it is a perfect opportunity, I think, for us to, to, to really change the perception of science and not in a, in, a, in a condescending way, but in a way that this is what helps people, right? And, and this is why we want more science advice, more scientists in, 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 in government structures, in embassies and, and, and in diplomatic relations, precisely because that is what helps um, people and what will get us out of this. And the, the question about the, um, why the countries with better science advice systems are not perhaps following the evidence is very important because I was, as I was saying, it is not only, it is not uh, enough to have those structures if the leader will not listen to them. So in the end, our best science advice mechanisms is, is our vote. So if you, I mean, you can have the best science advice in your foreign ministry in the world, but at the end, people elect their leaders. So it is our job to help people understand what leaders are going to be working in their best interests. And as I was talking about leadership and about these new models that I'm, uh, I've been part of uh, these trainings, it's about long, um, long view, long-term collaboration and international global mindset. So if we can get people to vote this type of leaders, uh, perhaps that's another way. So, you know, the, the, the individual vote is still a very important mechanism, not just the expert science advice structure. So both are important. So Mark, I think you, you could see, uh, you can see uh, some question and answers in your screen. Uh, the first two questions is about the, the fact, the first one is about the fact that there is some actors between diplomats and scientists. And yes. uh, the idea is how to deal with this, uh, in terms of promote uh, foster science diplomacy. Uh, the second one is uh, about the guarantee of to take visa in, in uh, science diplomacy. How to guarantee visa is about it, how to get it. And the, the, the third one is uh, the competition 
and the cooperation in uh, in, 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 med, in medical in medical uh, aspect in situations as a pandemic. We, we pre, uh, prevail competition and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go through a few of those. Um, yes, absolutely. The there is an ecosystem. We call it ecosystem of science diplomacy. It is so we simplify and we talk about scientists and diplomats, but this is obviously an oversimplification. There are so many actors that are involved in this uh, ecosystem and and. The, the question here, it's, uh, it mentions a few of them, research councils, um, as I was talking, academies of sciences. So there are state and non-state actors that complement uh, each other. So we should not think about only um, the foreign ministries or the embassies or the diplomats have a role in here and not only scientists as practicing scientists in academia. For instance, there is um, a big, uh, now uh, a big trend to, to of, of, um, forming this, um, what is called boundary spanning professionals, right? Boundary spanning means people who have been trained in one of the two domains, but also knows uh, how to interact and understand the other side. So they can be this bridge. And so this is not yet a very widespread um, training because it's an inter interdisciplinary training that, um, that many countries don't really have the, um, the, the capacity or they haven't found ways to foster those, um, those types of profiles that are also um, attached to having institutions that will house them, right? So one of the questions about that we get all the time that in, in science diplomacy trainings and, and um, initiatives is, okay, we train people, but then where do they go? So are governments and institutions willing to uptake these types of profiles that are kind of mediators and, and boundary spanning between the different worlds because if we don't create the spaces for them to 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 go afterwards basically we're creating a bubble right of people that are trained and very excited about uh, a professional path that that doesn't yet exist so it's very important i think to to foster those spaces and the examples that i mentioned in um in panama in uh, Mexico, uh, different um, structures for bringing those profiles in and, and, and helping governments connect all of the, all, all the parts of the ecosystem. And the same applies to, to the embassies. And, and maybe Pedro Ivo can, can talk uh, a bit more about this. How do you uh, build your scientific expertise and capacity in the diplomatic missions? Um, and that, is, that really differs um, across countries. Some countries are very strict in terms of who can occupy a position in an, a government office or an embassy. Um, and, and sometimes there's almost competition between the diplomats and the science diplomats that uh, go there. For instance, the US has an embassy science fellow program. So scientists can go for three months to a US embassy to, to support um, whatever program. Um, the UK has this um, UK Science and Innovation Network and they have science uh, scientists on the ground in many, many countries and Brazil as well as Pedro Ivo can, can talk about. But this is still not the majority. Most countries don't have those uh, types of profiles. And if you think about traditional uh, embassy staff, you think about political attaches and you think about economic and you think about cultural and education, but science is not yet there at that level. So one of the recommendations is for countries to, to really uh, create those uh, spaces for um, for the science, for the scientific capacity um, to to build it across the the entire ecosystem and the competition versus collaboration. Of course, that's a, an excellent question. I think it was Julia. Um, we all remember Trump saying uh, or attempting to buy a company in Germany that was making a vaccine, and I don't know. We don't know if this was like fake news or really was true. But the, just the idea of trying to get a vaccine only for your people, only for your country and not for the world, that is a completely futile exercise because you know, even if you succeed in getting the vaccine only for your people, then the rest of the world is gonna bring the, vaccine, the, the disease to you. So it doesn't make sense. So hopefully we will see the you know, leaders and countries recognizing that and that there is no point of just having something for you or just building a wall around you that so, so, so disease or climate change doesn't come in because it doesn't work like that. So hopefully this will bring the, that, that clarity. I think you're on mute, Amantia. I ask if Pedro Ivo and Professor Pierre Bruno wants to complement something. <laughs> 
Pedro? Yes, so uh, just to the point that uh, Marga mentioned, uh, yes, I think different countries have uh, different um, strategies with regards to the um, practice of uh, science diplomacy, specifically in embassies, as she rightly pointed out, and uh, this is the case of, for example, most of the European uh, countries uh, and also the US, uh, where there are actual uh, scientists or people or professionals who belong to, let's say, uh, scientific research institutions acting at sci as science diplomats in, in the embassies and uh, diplomatic uh, uh, missions. In the case of Brazil, we have uh, diplomats uh, mainly acting uh, as uh, science diplomats. That's my case here in New Delhi in India. Uh, let's say working on the bilateral relationship between India and Brazil in uh, science and innovation diplomacy. I think, uh, well, it uh, would maybe take uh, uh, another, um, let's say, webinar to discuss uh, what model is better, what model is worse. I think it very much depends on the, let's say, the, the, the intensity of the relationship and the nature of the relationship that, uh, and uh, also the topics that are, are, are handled. Uh, the thing is that, uh, and I think that is very important, and Brazil has particularly made, a, a, let's say, it's making a, a strong effort. Uh, my colleague, Luis Fernando, was here. I think he, he unfortunately left. He's, let's say, guiding the Brazilian science diplomacy from Brasilia. As uh, the effort we've been making is that uh, we have been providing uh, more and more, let's say, training and uh, really, uh, let's say, uh, useful information for those diplomats in the fields, in, in the embassies, to uh, be able to deal and to, let's say, grow uh, their, let's say, grow in their, let's say, responsibility as a science and technology uh, diplomats. So I think, uh, as said, I think there are different strategies to it. We can discuss it uh, further. But uh, I think, let's say, uh, in, in, in general, I think we have, uh, let's say, different approaches. Uh, Marga, uh, let, let's back to the same question. Probably you're not able to answer everything, but one of them is uh, difference in science diplomacy and science, international science cooperation. Yes. Sorry. I was trying to read the questions and, and, and find them. Um, yes, yeah, so the confusion comes from, um, for example, when you have scientists collaborating from different countries on um, whatever topic that produces a paper that goes into an academic journal. And that has no relation with any um, other broader aspect. Um, it is a collaboration for the sake of producing knowledge, right? So when we talk about diplomacy, I think we have to be a bit more strict uh, because not all collaboration is diplomacy. Diplomacy is not a, you know, it's, it's not about just um, altruistic um, collaboration in the sense that many scientists understand it. Diplomacy is really a strategy for advancing national interests. And of course, some of your, of your national interests are better advanced by working with others to jointly advance the interest if, um, if, if that is uh, um, uh, a goal for, for all of those involved. But really it is not about just uh, this sometimes can be naive view of uh, collaboration for just the betterment of the world. And I would love for the diplomats to, to, to clarify a little bit. And, 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 and I'm sure Pedro Ivo, you've, you've encountered this, the, uh, the conflation between international collaboration and, and science diplomacy sometimes can dilute the diplomacy part. And, and that's what makes something, sometimes the diplomats not very happy. And maybe uh, we could invite uh, Professor Ruffini to comment on this as he wrote an entire book, but also he was a science attaché for many years. So um, Professor Ruffini, would you like to, to comment? Um, hello. <clears throat> um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to join you um, this meeting. And first of all, I would like to um, to thank you, uh, Marga, for the, your great presentation. It's really a timely, uh, timely lecture. Um, 
I, I, my, my point, I would, I would like to ask you a question, not, not answering directly the one you just uh, um, mentioned, but um, uh, about the, co the, the COVID, which is the core of your, of your lecture. Uh, what, what strikes me, and you, you stress that in your, in, in your talk, what uh, strikes me is the, the gap, really the contrast, strong contrast uh, that we see between the, the reaction of the scientific community uh, which could answer quickly and, and coordinate at the global level on one side and uh, respond to reactions of the um, um, community of uh, governments, policymakers in, in countries, uh, which, are, uh, which have so many difficulties to coordinate their uh, response to the, uh, to the pandemic. And uh, uh, in some sense, um, I'm, I'm asking myself, you know, there are interfaces, of course, um, at the global level between uh, the, the global community of scientists and uh, the political uh, community, the community of states. But maybe what uh, the lesson that we can draw from what, what is happening is that there is weakness. Uh, they are weak. Such interfaces are weak. Um, um, and maybe being, being a little bit provocative, uh, does, it, does it not show some, some kind of failure of science diplomacy uh, in some sense, because at the global level, you see, uh, we see that um, the capacity of collaboration, of coordination of the scientists didn't spill over at all um, towards the political community. Um, and it could be possibly that uh, decision makers, politicians, do not understand enough what is science and should they understand better maybe they could react or understand better the need to coordinate at the global level well this is a question this is a comment on the question i don't know how you feel uh, yes. that but that's my that's my point right now yes th thank you professor uh, absolutely i mean that is the million dollar question right um i think there was sorry a, and uh, um in the beginning, so COVID moved from, right, like the sun from east to west, and every country that could see it coming didn't see it coming and then didn't act in the way that they could have probably anticipated some of the, from some of the damage. So this is really baffling when we think about how come after you see each and every country coming before you, um, you don't put the, uh, the mechanisms in place. But again, then how I, uh, like I said in, in the presentation, it depends on having those mechanisms in place um, permanently or having to scramble to get together the experts. And then even if you have those mechanisms permanently in place, then the decision maker deciding that they don't want them or not listening to them or um, th those structures, those interfaces not uh, working properly. So then the question, as you very well uh, point out, is what is the role of the global structures? The global structures where all the countries have participation and they are supposed to be the coordination body. The problem is that those structures are still very weak. So if you think about multilateral, any like the WHO, any multilateral um, structure, most of those um, recommendations or, or, or advice that they give are non-binding. So you cannot force a country for instance, you're going to force China to disclose and be transparent about data because there is no international enforcement mechanism that can force China to do anything in this space, right? So we have the UN Security Council. We have a few instances where the Security Council can activate sanctions and very strong measures against a country that does not comply or cooperate or participate in, in an agreement. But most of those... Um, um, agreements are non-binding, the same with climate change, right? So if you depend on voluntary uh, contribution or voluntary disclosure of data or voluntary cooperation, because you cannot intervene within the national jurisdiction of any country, and that's very important to understand as well. So the UN is not a world government. They cannot interfere within the borders of a, a sovereign state. So you can give advice, recommendations, guidelines, like the WHO has done, but you cannot force anything. And here I think it comes back to the soft and the hard power discussion that we had earlier. So if you want a country to share data with you, the best way is to build trust and to have a good relationship with that country before the conflict or before the, 
the, the emergency happens, because then you will be able to, uh, in better terms, ask, can you disclose your infection data with me? With me. If you are in bad terms, and if you are in a political um, challenging scenario, like China and the US have been for a while, then it is much more difficult. It is much more difficult to enforce and force them to do something. And then it is easy to blame, oh, you should have disclosed your data earlier, so it's your fault that now we have this disease. But you know, if you if you look back and, and go back to the to the to the um, to the origin of the problem, you can also trace it back to not having this global trust and this global coordination mechanism in a way that is not forcing people to do something, is not forcing countries to do something. It is understanding that it's in the best interest of all of them to share the data, to share the scientific information, to collaborate, because in the end it's in the benefit of all. Right? So does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, still, uh, it's really paradox paradoxical, the present situation, you see, because everybody seems to expect uh, the, the magic solutions coming from science, and it will come out from science, and it will not be magic at all. It will be science, of course. <laughs> and, but um, at the same time, the one who decide are not the scientists at all. The one who decide um, in the end, uh, about the policies, they are the politicians, you see, and there is, um, I'm still, uh, this, uh, this is really paradoxical to expect so much from science now and to be so weak, so unable on the political level to coordinate as scientists would probably recommend to do uh, from what we know about the virus, the way it uh, transfers from the, all over the world without uh, uh, taking care of borders and so on. So, so that's yeah. a really a challenging, really, really challenging situation. And uh, uh, it shows the, the long way still to go for science diplomacy to, uh, you know, to, 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 to be fully effective in, in such a shock, in such a challenging situation. Marga, uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to react? Because uh, I, would you like to raise attention for a, a comment uh, from Paulo Nascimento in the in the chat, and also a question from Laura Redondo: How can we coordinate the different speed of research and its protocol and the urgence of public policy? Other questions is about uh, the the role of non-state actors in science diplomacy. Several questions is raising this question. Thank you. Yes, so the role of non-state actors, as we were saying, is very important to have an ecosystem of science diplomacy because precisely of the government and the political fluctuations. So the case that I was explaining uh, with Cuba, um, in, um, in my work with Cuba, because I was part of a non-governmental organization that did not have any connection with the government, the US government, we were able to um, catalyze and fund and support relationships, scientific relationship, when the diplomatic uh, relations were, were strained. And what that meant is that there was an economic embargo, meaning that you could not use any federal funding to, uh, towards Cuba, right, for any purpose. So if there is no ecosystem of non-state actors and the two governments are not friendly, there are no other ways of advancing this science collaboration. If you have a, a robust ecosystem of non-state actors, those can help fill in when the diplomatic relations are not possible. So in our case, because we had non-governmental funding, we were able to freely move scientists and um, um, students and, and organize uh, workshops and exchanges and joint research, a fellowship program for scientists to work in each other's labs that would have not been possible if we didn't have a strong non-governmental side that allows um, the science to continue thriving when the political uh, situation does, does not allow it. So that's, I think, the importance. It, it illustrates the importance of not just thinking and, and, and not uh, um, focusing only on having science as a formal 
um, you know, channel in a scientific attaché position, for instance, or, or in a government. So it is extremely important for the scientists to be able to freely move around and to freely collaborate without depending on the relationship, good or bad, between the governments. And it's also a good example that another project that, that we did, I was not directly involved, but my office did, uh, with North Korea. So it was a project that um, aimed to study a volcano that is in the border between uh, North Korea and China. And that, that volcano had never been studied. It had never been looked at or, or examined by Western scientists, right? So North Korea had its own volcanologists and seismologists that were studying the volcano. But because there was a risk of eruption, eventually the volcano would erupt, the government, the North Korea government realized that it was in their best interest to invite scientists from other countries to jointly study the volcano. Because if the volcano erupts, it is not just an impact in North Korea, it is an impact in all the neighbors, right? So it is an example of how science diplomacy, you can use it for your national interest in that case, but it, it really needs you to collaborate with others in order to address this national interest. And so the collaboration involves US, uh, UK, and North Korean scientists working together to understand the volcano, and they publish a paper in Science Magazine to um, basically to legitimize that collaboration and show that it was not about, uh, you know, a political um, show or theater or just handshake, because sometimes, you know, you can, you can, um, you can imagine some people just wanting to have a handshake in, for, in front of the flag and calling science diplomacy. But if in order to be effective, the science needs to be legitimate. So in this example, we had the Royal Society and AAAS as, as non-state actors helping North Korean scientists understand a problem that would eventually become a global problem. Uh, and only because the funding did not come from the governments, we were able to overcome the sanctions and install instruments in North Korea that were under sanctions because of potential dual use technology, right? So these are examples of the importance of, um, of the non-state actors having that ecosystem. And I see a question that's related to this, so I will ask, I'll answer it. It's about the the systems of government, so democratic or non-government of non or non-democratic, in the COVID response. So this is a, an extraordinarily complicated question. So we see um, better management of pandemic in places that you have no freedom of movement and you have control on your phone 24/7 and your doorknob is um, there's a sensor that if you leave your house. Um, the government will know and somebody will come and say, no, you have to go home. So how it is extremely, I mean, complicated and I don't think we can, we can answer it, but um, how do you balance that, uh, you know, kind of top down control, um, the measures and the, and the, and the, uh, the solutions for a pandemic uh, in a democratic system and, and how, how do we balance those uh, very, very important. Those are, you know, way beyond science diplomacy. There are bigger, bigger questions. Um, and, and I don't know if any of you want to answer that question too. It's the, que the question about uh, China and Singapore. Any of the other panelists? Amante, you're on mute again. I think you, I think you covered uh, ever questions in general. And then, and then you keep some questions for the second edition of the, the inside, okay? <laughs> that, exactly. Is that okay? And so, we will be able to analyze more. Uh, yeah, so. For winter for you. Excellent. I would like, thank you. Thank you very much, Marga, and the other professor, Professor Lorena, Pedro Ivo, Professor Aris Plonsky, Janino Nuki, and uh, you see again. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your excellent uh, conference, Marga. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for, Thank. for inviting me and for, for being so active in the, in the discussion. Pedro, you can, you can close the session. Sure, sure. Well, thank everybody. We had a really impressive audience uh, here. And uh, especially I'd like to thank uh, Maga for taking her time uh, to address us in this very specific, uh, very, let's say, important uh, topic. I have myself also many questions. I would also like to have uh, engaged uh, more in the discussion, especially on the role of uh, government's uh, diplomacy in, in a situation like this. But uh, as uh, our, my friend Amancio said, I think uh, these un un 
unanswered and undiscussed the topics, uh, we, will, uh, we will leave for the second edition. So Marga, uh, thank you very much. I invite everybody to continue the discussion on our social media. I think this is a very important topic and we need to really keep the ball rolling. And uh, well, I now officially declare this uh, webinar closed. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Margaret. Thank you. Bye bye.